o Matt, ele é da, da Return Path, que o Vitor citou aqui na palestra dele. Ele é o chairman da, da empresa. Ele fundou a empresa ah, em 1999, após atuar como general manager da divisão de internet da Movifone, que foi vendida para a AOL por 600 milhões cinco anos depois. Matt, por favor. Bom dia a todos. Meu nome é Matt Lumberg e eu sou fundador e CEO da Return Path. Eu gostaria de agradecer aos organizadores da e-commerce Brasil pela oportunidade de estar presente neste grande evento. Infelizmente, esse é todo o meu português. Uh, agora vamos falar um pouco sobre a Return Path e email deliverability. How did I do there? <laughs> You know, we have uh, uh, a great team here for Return Path in São Paulo, and they're, they're a lot of fun. They have a lot of fun as, uh, as a group, and I always worry when I ask them to translate something for me that they're going to sneak in a couple of dirty words. <laughs> so, ho hopefully that was not the case, or at least they were good ones. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. Uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to join you for this conference. And um, uh, I'd like to speak about a few different topics, um, a little bit about e-commerce in general, uh, and then um, a bit about uh, the importance of email in e-commerce, uh, and then um, some specifics about email deliverability, uh, and hopefully we have some time at the end uh, for uh, some client uh, case studies. Um, I saw you just heard from uh, Victor, our friend from All In Media, which is one of Return Path's partners here. And uh, although I couldn't quite understand everything he was saying, um, I did see some words up there that I recognized uh, a few times. So hopefully what I say will uh, not be too much overlap uh, with what Victor said. Uh, so uh, a little bit about Return Path. Uh, our business is, uh, is not to help you deploy email campaigns. Um, that's what uh, many other providers do. Uh, and I know many of them are here at this conference as well. Uh, but Return Path's uh, job is to help make sure that your emails get um, properly delivered into uh, the inbox. Uh, we work with about 2,000 uh, clients globally and many top brands here uh, in the Brazilian market as well. And then we also work with a very large number of the uh, global mailbox providers and ISPs. Uh, so companies like Yahoo and Gmail and Hotmail, which I heard is ho Hochi Mail, is that right? Uh, and then uh, some of the local providers uh, in markets around the world as well. So in Brazil, Terra, and uh, UOL, and uh, LocalWeb. So to start by talking about some uh, e-commerce trends. Uh, at the end of 2011, uh, the global number for holiday sales of e-commerce across the world uh, reached $35 billion US, which was far and away the largest year that e-commerce has ever had. Uh, and in fact, there were 10 individual days at the end of the year that had more than a billion dollars in sales in a single day. Uh, so e-commerce is continuing uh, to grow and grow all across the world. Uh, there were, uh, mobile has also been uh, an incredibly important area of growth for e-commerce. Um, in Brazil, there are actually more mobile phones than people, uh, and uh, many people are now accessing the internet through mobile phones. Uh, and in uh, 2011, a lot of people predicted that it was going to be a big year for mobile commerce, and in fact, it was uh, a real game changer uh, in 2011. Uh, so, uh, in the U.S., mobile e-commerce sales reached $7 billion uh, in 2011, uh, and mobile also proved to be a real accelerator for e-commerce companies 
uh, at driving in-store purchases as well as online purchases. Uh, so mobile has been very good for multi-channel or cross-channel uh, marketing. Uh, the success of mobile has not only encouraged companies to keep investing in mobile in 2012, but has also led them uh, to hire more people with mobile skills uh, to build out the mobile versions of their websites, mobile versions of their email programs. E-commerce in Brazil uh, is fantastic. Uh, 32 million people in Brazil used e-commerce at least once in 2011. And uh, you know, from the perspective of, uh, of an American, uh, and we do business all over the world, uh, I'm used to going to Europe and thinking, oh, you know, Europe has a lot of big countries. Uh, you know, every, every country in Europe must be big. Uh, and then I realized things like, you know, Norway has four million people in the whole country, or Sweden has eight million people in the whole country. Uh, and uh, I come to Brazil, where Return Path has been in business for a little over a year now, and realize uh, that there are more people in Sao Paulo than in half of Europe. <laughs> uh, so the numbers in Brazil are fantastic. For most uh, global providers, uh, Brazil is a, a rapidly growing market uh, that uh, many people expect to be the number two market in the world behind the US before too long for things like e-commerce. Um, certainly I know that uh, Luis, who is our uh, country manager for Return Path here in Brazil, um, has promised me this will be the number two market for Return Path uh, very soon. So I think that's, uh, that's true very globally. And e-commerce in Brazil uh, is expected to grow uh, at least 25% here in 2012. So, uh, uh, so it's a great market. And what that means is that um, you know, la last year uh, the numbers were about 19 billion reais. Uh, and uh, that number should be uh, 24 to 25 uh, billion rei this year for e-commerce in Brazil. Um, something in the U.S. that we call Black Friday, which I understand uh, has been exported uh, to Brazil uh, and to other countries as well, uh, did a tremendous volume of e-commerce sales in 2011, 88% uh, higher than the prior year. and. Um, uh, there are just some tremendous things happening in this market. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Intel Capital. Uh, it's a venture capital firm in the U.S. that's owned by Intel, the chip manufacturer. Um, Intel has invested in five Brazilian startups over the past year. Uh, and since 1999, Intel Capital has invested $75 million in 25 different Brazilian companies. And just uh, recently, Intel Capital announced an investment in two e-commerce companies uh, in Brazil, Cocolux and Fashion.me. Uh, and uh, this is just representative of the way a number of the investment companies in the United States are thinking about the opportunity uh, in Brazil and the growth of the Brazilian e-commerce market. So uh, what does all of this mean uh, for you? It means that uh, there is a big opportunity uh, to drive revenue uh, online in Brazil and with global customers for e-commerce. And uh, at Return Path, we like to think that email is a key tactic for accessing uh, this great opportunity in e-commerce. Uh, as marketers, you have many, many different tactics, many channels, many things you can do. Uh, but email is a major driver of website traffic. Uh, it can directly induce purchase. It's a great branding vehicle. Uh, and uh, it gives you a great amount of flexibility at a relatively low cost. So, so what's not to love about email? Uh, some interesting statistics uh, that we found uh, globally. 72% uh, of companies that use email and other channels uh, to market online for e-commerce rate email as either excellent or good uh, for their ROI or return on investment. And consumers love email as well, uh, which is not surprising given uh, that companies love it. It must be because consumers respond to it and consumers love it. Uh, so 42% of consumers said the best way to receive ads for sales, specials, coupons is via email. And uh, as I've uh, said for many years, email is the first channel in the history of the world where people actually sign up to receive your ads. Uh, and that is, uh, that's a great thing for marketers. 
Um, email has been consistently rated as the top performing channel for marketers globally. Uh, and according to the Direct Marketing Association in the US, the return on investment or the payback on email is almost 50 to one. So every dollar that gets put into email, $50 comes back. Uh, in the US, uh, over two thirds, 68% of consumers uh, in the key demographic group of 18 to 26 uh, used emailed coupons online to make purchases. And email has also gone increasingly mobile. Uh, over the last year, there was a 73% increase in iPad usage. And now, about 23% of email views are done on mobile. And that number is growing. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the statistics for email usage and where people are accessing their inboxes, uh, there, are, there are basically three uh, areas to look at. There's webmail. Uh, desktop mail clients like Outlook or Apple Mail and mobile. And over the last couple of years, webmail page views have gone down, desktop have been flat, and mobile have been going up. So overall, people are using email more, but their habits are shifting and they're starting to use it more on smartphones and tablets. Uh, and that obviously has some real uh, repercussions for people who are doing a lot of email marketing making sure that you're designing both email and landing pages uh, to work appropriately um, on smaller screens and in particular with iPad in environments uh, with, uh, for landing pages uh, that don't require flash. Uh, in most countries, um, there are only a couple of channels that beat email as mobile activities, usually just taking pictures and text messaging. Uh, email is used more often on mobile devices than social networking, than reading content, news and information, uh, more often than playing games, and more often even than listening to music on mobile devices. Uh, so one of the questions I always get asked uh, when I speak is, hey, you know, isn't mobile and isn't social hurting email and having email volumes go down? And it's actually the opposite. Uh, so social is driving usage of email and growth of email. If you sign up for a Facebook account or a Twitter account, the first thing you do is you have to put in your email address. Uh, so the social platforms all use email to run their business. And in terms of uh, mobile, the availability of email is now across devices. It's a very natural cloud-based uh, application because your data is always in the cloud and in sync across devices. So mobile and social uh, have both been very, very good for the continued growth of email. So uh, the question is, what happens if your email never gets there? Um, email that doesn't get to the inbox obviously can't be responded to. Uh, no one can click. Uh, there's no return on it. Uh, and therefore, there's no ROI. And it's uh, wasted dollars on behalf of marketers. Uh, it's wasted dollars in email transmission. It's wasted dollars uh, in terms of customer acquisition costs. And there's obviously a big opportunity cost uh, in missed sales as well. One of the things that we do at Return Path is we measure what we call inbox placement. Uh, so part of deliverability is understanding how many of your emails uh, reach inboxes, how many get placed in spam folders, and how many never reach uh, the network or the end user in any way, shape, or form at all. So we measure these statistics globally. Uh, we measure them a couple of times a year, and we actually have uh, a new study coming out, I believe, next week, uh, which will update uh, the data. Uh, so I think the data here is from uh, the most recent study, which is toward the end of last year. Uh, and uh, we measure hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of campaigns across all the geographies. Uh, and uh, globally, uh, it turns out that about 25% of all email never reaches an inbox. Uh, some of it gets placed in a junk mail folder, some of it gets blocked, uh, but uh, almost one in four emails never reaches the inbox. And the data for Brazil in particular uh, is, is quite surprising. Brazil is one of the uh, most difficult countries to have email reach the inbox. In Brazil, uh, it's about 35%, so more than a third of legitimate non-spam email that gets blocked or filtered. So uh, 
online retailers, e-commerce uh, companies, publishers are absolutely leaving money on the table if they don't pay attention to email deliverability. So I know Victor from All In was talking about um, some of the uh, aspects around uh, email deliverability. Uh, and I'd like to spend the rest of the time here uh, talking uh, about the same. So the question that, uh, that marketers always ask us is, uh, my emails are good, I'm not a spammer, uh, people signed up for my mail, so why do ISPs block my mail? And uh, the, the very uh, short answer is that uh, ISPs use what's called your sender reputation uh, to make decisions about filtering. And reputation sounds like a very qualitative thing, but it is actually a very quantitative thing. Uh, and there are many things that you can do uh, to understand and impact your reputation. And the, you know, the origin of this, the reason that filters work this way, is that uh, by and large, ISPs are overwhelmed by spam. Uh, their networks have about 95% spam uh, and an enormous number of emails. Uh, this year, uh, across the whole world, people will send about 100 trillion emails, which is a, an enormous number. Uh, usually in America, when we hear things in the trillions, um, people are talking about the government's debt. Uh, but 100 trillion emails is a big number, and if you think 95% of them are spam, 95 trillion emails need to be blocked and filtered. So ISPs are doing the best they can with the tools they have uh, to block everything that's bad and let in everything that's good, but they make some mistakes. Um, we all know that because a little spam makes it into your inbox. It's not 95% of your inbox. Uh, but as we just saw a moment ago, uh, about 25% of legitimate email doesn't get through either. So ISPs are using sender reputation, uh, which basically uh, is a measure for them of how much uh, a piece of email seems to be spam or looks like spam. Number three is consistency of branding. So your emails need to be easily recognizable. They need to match the branding that the consumer expects when he or she signs up to receive your emails in the first place. If it's something they don't expect, they're more likely to click the spam button. Uh, certainly uh, your uh, uh, content and program relevancy impacts behavior. So if consumers are getting what they expect, they're less likely to click the spam button. Um, and then finally, you need to do analysis. Uh, you need to have someone on your team or on an analytics team or finance team in your company um, understand who is complaining to your messages. So if you've signed up to the ISP's feedback loops and you're uh, receiving information on complaints and taking those people off your list, do the analysis to find out who they are. Maybe they're all coming from one particular uh, data source. Maybe there's one particular demographic on your database. Um, and you might be able to make adjustments to your program that way. Uh, the second thing uh, that you can do to minimize uh, filtering is to have a solid infrastructure. So for those of you who use one of the major email service providers, they take care of this for you. They do a great job of it. Um, but uh, typically, homegrown systems are the most susceptible uh, to blocking and filtering from not having their infrastructure quite set up the right way. So things like open proxies and open relays, uh, things like not authenticating your outbound mail um, are likely to cause problems for your mail program. Uh, spam traps are a real problem. And I did see that Victor had spam trap, that word showed up on a number of slides. So. Um, I'm not quite sure what he said about them, hopefully consistent with uh, what I'll say. Um, but this is a significant problem. And there are basically two different types of addresses that can be on your list that are spam traps. One are, are addresses that used to be real and are no longer real. So making sure that you uh, stop mailing at some point to people who've been inactive for six months or 12 months is an important way to keep spam traps off your address. So if people haven't opened or clicked on a message, um, in, in six or 12 months, uh, there's a higher risk that those consumers' uh, addresses have turned into spam traps. And the second type of spam trap address that could find its way onto your list is an address that um, was never supposed to sign up for email in the first place. It's not a real address that's owned by a real person. Uh, those can find your way onto lists uh, if you do co-registration, 
um, and uh, some partners like to sneak names onto your list and charge you more money for them. The easiest way to deal with this is to make sure that the minute someone signs up for your list, you send them an email to confirm their subscription. And even if you don't require them to click on that email, at least make sure that bounces that come back from that welcome email or confirmation email, you immediately take off your list. Um, when ISPs see a very high percentage of bounces, uh, they assume that you're a spammer. Uh, so high bounce rates are a good indicator of low reputation. Uh, and uh, just very important to clean bounces off of your list. There's no magic number, uh, whether it's one bounce, two bounces, five bounces. It kind of depends on your mailing frequency. Uh, but you should be trying overall to keep your bounce rate probably around 2% or less, um, certainly under 10%. But we have a number of clients who have their bounce rates well under 1%. Uh, the next thing you can do is maintain a permanent home. Uh, there are a lot of people who feel like, hey, if my reputation is bad and it's causing me to be blocked and filtered, what I need to do is get new IPs uh, or maybe even change my domain. And actually, uh, changing IPs is a trigger that, IPs, uh, that ISPs uh, look at. And in connection with everything else you're doing, might be something that sets off spam filters. So it's certainly OK to change IPs if you're switching providers or moving from an in-house system to a provider. Um, but you have to be very careful about how you do it. And you can't do it regularly. Um, second to last thing is you need to be testing your content uh, for what we call spam filter fitness. So content filters are only a small part of filtering, uh, but very important. Uh, to use tools, uh, and there are many available um, across the internet, to test and see what the spam score is of your messages. And finally, around the topic of engagement, uh, we always encourage our e-commerce uh, marketer clients to think of their audience as, uh, think of their subscribers as an audience, uh, not just as targets. Send them interesting content. Um, pretend that you're a publisher, and you're trying to get them to engage and read your emails. Uh, this is a great way to minimize complaints as well. Uh, so many people uh, ask us all the time, how can I tell what my reputation is? Uh, and although this is part of Return Path's commercial business, we do have a free website uh, that's called senderscore.org uh, that you can visit and you can look up uh, your reputation of your IPs and your domain uh, and understand, uh, without paying any money, a little bit about how you're doing, how ISPs think about your mail and view your mail. So the good news with all of these things is, as the marketer, as the e-commerce company, you're in control of your own reputation. Uh, you control your own destiny. You can understand how you're doing against the key metrics around reputation. Uh, and you can uh, do a lot to fix them yourself. Um, I'll close with two very quick case studies uh, from uh, clients, one that's in Brazil and one that's global. Uh, so the global client is uh, Groupon. And uh, Groupon is uh, obviously now one of, the, one of the largest emailers in the world. Is this working? Is this on? Yeah. There we go. Groupon, uh, one of the largest emailers in the world that's been a client of ours for a couple of years. Uh, before Groupon started working with Return Path, about 20% of their e email was going into the junk mail folder, uh, and we've now gotten that down to zero, so all of their mail is delivered. And uh, Groupon's a very sophisticated direct marketer. They constantly are doing A-B split tests, some of the mail certified, some of the mail not certified, um, and just consistently see that the certified mail is generating more opens, more clicks. Um, and in the case of Groupon, who's sending out, this year I think they're going to send out 50 billion emails worldwide, uh, their mail actually gets delivered a lot faster, 40% faster. Um, and uh, the second case study for a Brazilian, uh, a Brazilian retailer, Saks, uh, that you probably all know, um, experienced by working on their reputation and working with Return Path, um, a huge percentage increase in open rates and click-through, and actually a 44% a increase in revenue coming from e-commerce. Uh, as a result of improving their reputation and getting certified by Return Path. Um, so absolutely uh, tremendous, tremendous business results. Um, I, I always uh, joke with our team that I, I keep waiting for the vendor to come in and increase our revenue by 44%. Uh, 
that's, uh, that's just great results. So um, thank you very much. I uh, am happy to take a couple of questions. I think I have to put on headphones so that I can uh, understand your questions. So give me a moment with that. But um, that's my email address uh, and my mobile if you have any follow-up questions for me. Uh, and uh, Louis Bucciarelli is uh, the head of our office here in Sao Paulo. Uh, we have a wonderful team of 10 people here as well. So emailing uh, Louis or looking at uh, br.returnpath.net if you have uh, any additional questions as well. So let me put on the uh, headsets and happy to take a question. Question? Um, Matt, você falou, ok? Uh, você falou, tudo ficou muito claro, que a venda hoje, usando o e-mail marketing, demanda um profundo... Sorry. Tudo isso que você falou, além da inteligência que está por trás de toda a estratégia que deve ser feita no uso do e-mail marketing, como o POM faz, demanda um respeito pelo cliente, ok? Considerando esse respeito e a personalização, por exemplo, eu recebo o e-mail do Groupon hoje na minha caixa de entrada. Há um tempo atrás ia sempre para a caixa de saída. Esse trabalho no Brasil também é de vocês? Sim? Yes? Ah, good. <laughs> good. Yes, re, you good. know, re, reputation uh, is, is directly tied to complaints. So it does have everything to do with respecting your customers, uh, treating them well, meeting their expectations, and sending interesting and relevant mail. Fantastic.